Welcome back guys. Today we are looking at metals, specifically ferrous and non-ferrous metals, some of the common metals from each and understand the different properties and uses. So we've got a lot to do today, let's get to it. So our two categories, so ferrous are iron based. Now from the periodic table you might recognise that the symbol is Fe and the reason is that uh, from the Latin of ferrum, that's why they're called ferrous. They are magnetic, they're also cheap and abundant, which is why we see them every year, everywhere, and they're used for a lot of different things. However, they are prone to corrosion. By that we mean oxidation reaction with uh, the elements with um, in the air. Um, so they are prone to rusting. So we tend to need to coat them. And uh, they usually contain a percentage of carbon. Non-ferrous, comparatively, uh, are our pure metals. So things like silver and gold, not that we're looking at those today. They are typically non-magnetic and they are tend to be rarer, so they tend to be more expensive or quite expensive. But they have really useful properties. Uh, they're more malleable or you know aesthetic properties and we're going to go through those today. So I've tried to table them for you to make it really nice and easy to understand. We have 10 that we're going to learn today in total, 5 ferrous and 5 non-ferrous. I've categorised the ferrous by their percentage of carbon. So the first one is called low carbon, which is funnily enough, but it's also known as mild steel. You do need to know both names. I know it's a bit of annoying, um, but they tend to be used interchangeably. And we also have high carbon, <laughs> funnily that, but it's also known as tool steel. So low carbon, mild steel, high carbon, tool steel. And then the one with the highest percentage in total is cast iron. Now, our non-ferrous metals are just categorised by an alphabetical order. So we're going to look at aluminium, copper, tin and zinc. And for each, we have some alloys that we need to know about. So our ferrous alloys are high speed steel and stainless steel. And our non-ferrous alloy is brass. Just to start you off and pique your interest, I've included this absolutely fantastic video. Um, which I think you'll find really interesting. So go and give it a watch. I'll see you back in a sec. Let's take a look at some ferrous metals. I've included this picture for its huge crucible, uh, very high temperatures that we need for steel. So our first is our low carbon or mild steel. Now in each case, I've tried to give you a little icon to help you remember um, as we go. So this is going to be all about sheet. So low carbon, it has less than 1%, typically around half a percent of carbon. It is really strong and cheap and easy to weld. It is used absolutely everywhere. However, it rusts easily, as we've covered. So it's not corrosion resistant, which is why it needs to be covered or plated or painted in some way. So we tend to use, uh, comes in components, things like screws, nuts and bolts, but any sheet material like car bodies, appliances and oil drums. So anything that comes in a sheet is low carbon or mild steel. Next, we have our high carbon or tool steel. So if it tends to come in a tube like format or in a blade, it's usually this. So it contains just above 1%, about 1.5% carbon. It's extremely hard, even at high temperatures. However, it is uh, just get brittle, uh, so it's not easy to work and rusts. So when we're talking about high temperatures, we're talking about friction. Anything that you would expect uh, to get really hot um, as it's worked, so drill bits, files, um, you know, blades, these will get really hot because of friction. But because uh, this tool steel is so hard, it resists that. However, you do it enough and it will become brittle and it might snap. And then cast iron. Anything that comes in a big old lump is usually cast iron. So this has 2 to 4% carbon, the highest in total, and it casts really easily, hence like the picture here. However, it is hard, but it's also brittle. So it has really strong compressive strength, um, but it can break if dropped, hit or stretched. So like this manhole cover over here, it can resist thousands, millions of cars driving over it. But if you were to uh, bang it on the side, it may well crack. I have this really short, excellent video for you on sand casting. Now, this is not a requirement for you to know, but if you want to get those higher grades, seven, eight, nine, 
then this is something that's really worth being familiar with. There are lots of videos out there. This is the shortest by far. So give it a watch. And don't forget, of course, that we have Focus eLearning Online, which is an amazing resource. It can be a bit clunky at times, but there is a whole section just on metal manufacturing processes if you ever need to know about any of these. So here even just an example of sand casting. Uh, there's some really fantastic uh, 3D um, sort of images that you can rotate in space. There's lots of multiple choice questions. It's a really great resource. Look at all those different types of processes. Now let's get to our non-ferrous metals. I've included this picture because it's representative of the amount of recycling that is really needed to make these cost effective. So first is aluminium. So it's a very, very lightweight metal. It has an excellent strength to weight ratio. That is why it is used for things like plane parts. The amount of fuel that you would need to get a plane off the ground if it was made entirely of steel, perhaps, um, would be uh, very significant. So that is why they're always made of aluminium. It's also corrosion resistant. It doesn't react with oxygen, um, or rather it actually creates a, a protective layer called ammonium oxide. Um, and it's also uh, malleable. And that's what makes it really good for things like these window frames. Now, they tend to be replaced nowadays with things like PVC with plastic window frames. But back in the 80s, they were all the rage uh, because they were so corrosion resistant. And of course, it's a good conductor of heat and electricity. That's what makes it really good for things like packaging uh, and uh, for you know foil cans put in the oven. Uh, however, it is expensive. So it's, uh, it's sampled from bauxite, which is a very expensive process, uh, uses electricity to extract it. It's also hard to join. So those aluminium cans, 6,700 a second or 180 billion a year, we really do need to recycle those to keep it in the loop. It's copper. So it's a very ductile and conductive of heat and electricity. That's what makes it such an excellent resource uh, for wires for uh, in your walls. Um, it also uh, makes for amazing cookware. If you are an owner of a full set of copper pans, I'm very jealous indeed. Not just that, but it's also malleable and it's aesthetically pleasing. It also uh, makes for really good for pipe work because it conducts uh, heat and you can join it really well. However, it is expensive. That's why the cookware is so expensive. Um, but that's why people will break into buildings and strip the electrical wires out of the wall just to sell for scrap. Our last two are tin and zinc. Now, there's a lot of similarities between them. So tin, uh, so tin is corrosion resistant and it's basically just used to coat other metals. It can be used in a, in a, uh, on a metal on its own, um, but not very commonly at all. These cans over here are all made of steel, but if they were just left uncoated, uh, the food inside, of course, is going to have to go absolutely disgusting as the steel starts to rust. So that is why they are covered in tin, and that's why they're known as tins. It also has a very low melting point, and it's fusible. That's what makes it uh, really great, not only for coating, but also the fact it's so ductile makes it great for uh, alloying with lead to use for solder, which, of course, we use in for electronics at school. And zinc, next, I mentioned they're very similar. That's because both tin and zinc are both incredibly corrosion resistant and used to coat other metals. Now, zinc is used more so than tin typically in a process called galvanization, which is a hot dip process through a big bath of molten zinc. It's very cool, but it's not very strong on its own, just as, uh, as zinc uh, um, without the coating. So pretty much all the appliances you will find in your house and your kitchen uh, will be zinc coated or galvanized and like these paint cans here. And this isn't a requirement to know about galvanization, but it's such a cool video. So this huge steel girder that's used for a football stadium has been dipped in a bath to clean it and then an acid bath to get rid of any oxidized and then a big galvanizing bath. It's really very cool, very satisfying to watch. I would strongly recommend it. To our alloys. So our ferrous alloys, our first is high speed steel. And this is very much the big brother of tool steel. So this has a small percentage of carbon, but it has 10 to 25% chromium, tungsten, and vanadium. 
So tungsten in particular is an incredibly strong metal, crazy strong. So anything that you would expect to uh, take high temperatures because of friction and cutting, again, are drill bits, saw blades, anything like that, you would expect to be high speed steel. And then we have stainless steel. So um, our, in this case, I've got a little droplet, a little water droplet to, do, to remind you about the fact it's so corrosion resistant. So it contains 1% carbon, 11% chromium and 10% nickel. So it is used in kitchenware uh, for um, anything that you might interact where it might get uh, splashed with water as well as surgical equipment. And it makes not only that, it's also more tough, strong and ductile. So um, anything that you would expect to see, it's probably going to be stainless steel. Now to our on ferrous alloy, uh, we are looking at brass. So brass is 55 to 95% copper and then comparatively 5 to 45% zinc. So obviously the quantities vary, um, but that's why it has this lovely kind of uh, luster and colour to it. So it has this golden like colour because it has a high percentage of copper, but the zinc sort of offsets it so it's not quite so red. It's really malleable, uh, ductile and conductive like copper, but corrosion resistant like zinc. So remember, um, alloys uh, and also our composite materials, right? They are taking the best properties from each thing. So it makes it really good for things like plumbing, Okay, for instruments, it's also because it's ductile, you can stretch it out. Um, it makes really lovely homewares um, and it's gold luster, of course, it makes it look like gold, but it's a fraction of the cost. So it makes really great jewellery. Most of my jewellery at home that looks like gold is certainly not gold, it's mostly brass. And we need to just go through stock forms as well, uh, just like we do for every other material. So it's available in sheet, think mild steel, uh, rod, bar and tube, think copper as well. Uh, it's more lightweight, stiffer, decorative and less costly than the solid equivalent. It's sold by length, width, thickness and diameter. And standard components we've mentioned, of course, include screws, nuts, bolts and rivets. These are rivets over here in case you didn't know. Get to some questions in a second, but I've got a really easy one to start you off. So which is the odd one out? Pause the video, have a think and I'll give you the answer in a sec. So the answer is, of course, these cans are made of aluminium, whereas this bench, this uh, cutlery and these scissors are made of steel. Of course they are. So we're going to look at some questions now. So uh, for each, I'd like you to think about the material and a reason for your choice. And you can have a go at the challenge as well if you wish. So pause the video and then we'll go through the answers in a second. OK, let's go through the answers. So this uh, chair, of course, is going to go outside. I, you, I would expect that you would put uh, aluminium. You could have also put stainless steel, although it tends to be quite heavy. You could also put plated or galvanized steel. So the reasons is that it's strong, suitable for outdoor use. It needs to be corrosion resistant and lightweight. So this pan to go in the oven, I would expect that you would have put something like low carbon or mild steel. You could have put stainless steel, possibly even tin or copper with a Teflon coating. The reasons are it needs to be strong with good thermal conductivity, uh, mould well and cost you could have included as a thought in terms of uh, making it from steel. And then for our cup, so this is actually DOV approved and they actually make it from titanium. So this is a bit of a cheeky uh, question, but if you'd put aluminium, that would have been perfectly reasonable too, because of course it is corrosion resistant or you could have put stainless steel. So the reasons are it needs to be corrosion resistant, it needs to withstand being outdoors, being bashed around, it needs to be hard and it needs to be lightweight. So it's not going to uh, affect the, uh, the hikers on their trip. How to go at the challenge? Well done. So metal ore extraction is energy intensive. The material can be recycled. The product is made from recycled material. So have a think about how those might have applied. Here's our recap. So ferrous metals are iron based, magnetic, cheap, but prone to corrosion. They're often coated for protection. Non-ferrous are non-magnetic, more expensive, but with useful properties like coatings and uh, aesthetics. Low carbon, mild steel, high carbon or tool steel, cast iron, high speed steel and stainless steel were our ferrous metals. Aluminium, copper, tin, zinc and brass were our non-ferrous metals. And we talked about stock forms. Well done, guys. Lots to do today. Good job. See you next time.